All right, what's up, you guys? Early, I'm up early this morning. Uh, enjoyed myself last night at the, uh, we celebrated Independence Day um, of the Ivory Coast. So today we have the beautiful Angelica Diallo with us. And we're gonna be talking about uh, principles of African femininity. Um, you know, she's written her book called Yoniverse. I had to throw the African in there because I just throw African in everything. Um, so, Miss Diallo, how are you this morning? I'm doing wonderful this morning. Thank you for having me on your panel, on yeah. your platform. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I'm honored greatly. Really? Oh, I, I appreciate it. We've been trying to connect for a minute now. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I was always an avid fan of yours before we even, like, connected and spoke. So I'm like, oh, this guy, he's traveling. He should do, like, his own travel show. and and show you know the rest of the world like what it's like and, and the dynamics of of being a brother from here traveling to you know the home continent so I, it's always been love on my end most definitely okay well i'm glad uh let me ask you how did, how did you uh i promise you this would not be about me but i just i always i'm always inquiring on how people uh find me how did you how did you stumble upon uh, the videos originally um, it was in my suggested feed, and you know, I I watch a lot of weird stuff on YouTube, and I, and I do watch a lot of travel bloggers or vloggers, I should say. Mm -hmm. And watching, I don't know whose channel, and then you came up, and I was like, oh, it's not quite often that I see younger brothers traveling and documenting their travel. So I was, you know, I was magnetized from like the thumbnail. I'm like, oh snap! So. It wasn't my suggested lift, but um, I, I'm glad that I came across it because you definitely, when I, when I first saw your channel and your videos, it was really a breath of fresh air because it's not, there, prob there may be other brothers, but I haven't come across any other men that, that even on the level that you do it, um, present that sort of content. I appreciate it. There's a, another brother, he has a page called uh, Passport Heavy. But he doesn't. He doesn't focus on the continent like I do. He's everywhere, and he's rarely in the continent like me. I'm just strictly focusing on Africa. That's until I hit all 54 countries. Even after that, I'm not. You know, I'm just focusing on um, the motherland. That's my uh, primary focus. So, where, 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 yeah, did, are you in Virginia? Like, where are you uh, located? I'm, I'm in Delaware. Delaware. How is everybody plans? How is Delaware? How is how is that? Delaware is um it it's just um that's that's what it is. It it has, you know, the the, the main city Wilmington has become over the years in disarray. It has modeled itself very much like um I guess like the urban areas of Philly. There's been a lot of homicides and, and shootings by police. Um, but generally, Delaware, the, the state itself, is um, it's it's more of a of a bedroom state. It's not really a place to go, and there's lots of activities. There's I don't even think at this point there's any black clubs, like actual clubs. Like there's bars that you can go to, but there's not a single club in the state. If I'm aware, it may be down by the beaches, but not up on my end. As far, as far as a black black club yeah like you know like an actual club you know a place with a dance floor <laughs> oh, wow. that's built as a club you know there's a lot of makeshift places but nothing that i'm aware of presently um that's like that i mean there, there are things places here and they are building a lot you know the, a couple of major malls are expanding and you know we have what do we have now we have uh, I, I can't even think because I don't I don't really shop at the mall. I do a lot of online shopping, but there's not it's not a whole lot here. But you can go to the beach and you can find some horseshoe crabs on the beach, and <laughs> that's really about it. There's not much going on in Delaware. That, that's why if you ever hear about Delaware on TV, we're always clowned on TV. I, I hear with Family Guy always makes jokes about Delaware, like we try to post billboards claiming that we're really exciting and once people get here, they're let down by the boring 
the amount of boringness, if that's a word, <laughs> in the state. So there's not, it's a corporate state. It's meant for people who are ready, either ready to retire or they're running a corporation as it. Okay. Now you were a military brat, so you kind of lived everywhere. What, uh, what other, I guess, cities or states did you, did you live in? Um, I've been to San Diego. I've been okay. to to Jordan, I've been to Madagascar, I've been to Florida, New York, obviously Delaware. Um, I visited a lot of countries, but the places I listed prior are the places that I've actually lived throughout my life. Now, your dad is originally from a Senegal, correct? Correct. Correct. Now, now what, what, what kind of influence, as far as Senegalese influence, did he, did he have on you? Well, it's really interesting because my, my father, um, his childhood, he was back and forth from Africa to here a lot. Okay. And I, I think because of that, although my father was born in Africa, he's heavily influenced by American culture. Okay. So he has some remnants in, in some of the, his core beliefs, I should say, um, th that I feel kind of derived from Africa. but. Largely, I want to say eighty percent of him is American. Okay. When you, do you, do you like what specific core beliefs? Um, when, you, when you when you bring that up now, since we're dealing with femininity, him interacting with women, I guess, <laughs> from an African perspective, how how different was it than I guess maybe Black American men interacting with women, or is it the same that you that you notice? Um. Well, uh, well. To, in order to explain that, I have to kind of divulge a, a little bit of myself. Um, my father, my father is not the sort of man that believes in like the concept of love, mm -hmm. in the sense where um, I guess how generally it's defined, like that immense feeling that you have towards someone. And I'm not saying that um, largely that like, this is an African thing, but I, I am aware that relationships aren't necessarily built solely because of love or the emotions that um, one has for another. And, you know, for him, his relationships, and, to, and again, to go a bit further, there was a stint in my life where my father had two wives. Mm -hmm. So for a few years of my life, I, I was raised in, uh, I guess, what people would call a polygynous or a plural family, mm -hmm. um, which was cool for me. I, I thought it was awesome. I thought, to be honest, I thought that was normalcy. I thought all people did that until um, mm -hmm. I went to New York and found out that the opposite was true. So um, it, it's just the way that he, and his, his reverence for women is different. Like he, the way that, as a child, that I, I watched him engage with both of my mothers was, it's you like he well, understood. You said both of your mothers, so you're so, talking about. Yeah, I, can, I consider both, like my biological mom, and I, I consider them both moms. Okay. Um, so the, the way that he, the way that, and, it, and it's hard to explain, but there was like a certain reverence that he had for his women mm -hmm. in the sense of he understood the value of women first. And okay. then what he also did was he made sure that the environment conducive for them to thrive was a priority for him. Not to say that, and, and, and <laughs> And a lot of times that I say this, a lot of people just take it as one side of, well, oh, she's saying this and she's saying that all black men from America aren't doing that. I'm not saying that. But from my experiences as a child, it was really unique because I had, I was never presented with a man um, that valued women just because they were women, not because they were his women, but because they were women. Mm. And, you know, the, the few people that I know that um, that are fully African and the base of who they are is from Africa. 
I do see a lot of similarities in that and how the men regard and, and, and treat their women. So um, there's that for me. And uh, I don't know, he, he you know, he, he always, <laughs> he always had a way of telling stories as well. Um, and, and, and again, you know, I'm, I'm heavily Americanized. I don't, I don't want people to have the impression that um, I, for a second, would dare to say that I'm more African than African American. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, being an adult now and looking back and, and thinking about the old traditions, he always had a moral to a story. There was never a story that he told that didn't have a certain meaning to it, opposed to just telling stories because they were fun or they were cute or or whatever, but there, there was always some sort of significance to the stories that he did tell us. Now, now I guess that is it. Hold on. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, there's, just, there's an echo. Okay, the echo's gone, the echo's gone. Um, now, experiencing, uh, we'll say a polygamous relationship as far as your father and his wives, are like, are you open as a woman to being a part of a polygamous, polygamous uh, relationship? I myself personally, I am because, like I said, as a child, you know, I grew up in it, so I seen the value in it, and I seen the, the possibility of the positivity that can be had in a relationship that's set up that way. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that it's not for everyone. Like, not every woman is built to mentally physically emotionally is built to handle that sort of dynamic and you know some men aren't built to um have two women under the same roof you know and and these are things that i think um one if you're not exposed to it from a young age it, it takes a while for one to i guess assimilate themselves in that sort of for one state of mind but the physical dynamic of having you know two women or two women sharing one husband and you know for me and to be honest i did my my marriage i tried and it and that's when i realized that it's not for everybody okay. and and just because i wanted it i think what i did was i admit i dismissed the fact that he at that point in his life wasn't ready for it so it, w it was kind of more of me pressing you know this is something that i was brought up in let you know i'm really interested in seeing if this is a viable thing and a lot of things just kind of spiral out of control after that so i, I think it works but i'll just tell people that it's not for everybody it's not you, now you say so you were married at one time are you still currently married or no no, I'm divorced. That you, now, as far as bringing in the other woman, did your husband have the other woman, or did you bring her into the, I guess, family? Well, that was that. That was one of the first problems. He kind of went out on his own and picked a woman and decided this is the one that he wanted, and and all these things without any regard to my say or my approval or um, really building any relationship prior to where they were like they had a full separate relationship by the time that i was made aware of it okay so did she was she okay so in your idea i guess polygamous uh marriage or relationship will the other woman also live in the same house with you because i know in senegal my buddy abdul his father has three wives so they all live together they all have their separate quarters, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then I guess whenever it's time to come together and do the thing, they just come to his room, but they all have like their separate quarters. Like what would be the ideas, ideal setup as far as, uh, will it all be in one separate, in one household or you guys live separate households? Like how would you, how would you do that? Well, I mean, for me, ideally, I, I think just on a financial basis, it would just be easier to be all under one roof. But, you know, women are complex and, sh you know, if I was to ever be in a situation like that again, you know, the sister, she may not 
want to be in the same house, you know, and, and that would be something that we would have to decide as a collective. So ideally, it's easier to be under one roof um, and things are managed a lot easier that way as well. But, you know, you have to deal with the dynamics of the women, because for me, the way that I look at it as I want to establish a, a, a sistership with her. I want to have a, a, a bond with her that is autonomous of him. Because at the end of the day, and I think this is what a lot of um, people, black folks here in America miss, is that the, the household itself doesn't function if the women don't have a viable relationship, if they don't, they don't respect each other as women and, um, and respect the dynamics of that relationship and the quirks that they individually have and even the strengths and weaknesses. And if that relationship isn't solidified first, I mean, regardless of what the husband does, the, the, the whole thing is just going to fall apart at some point. One sister's going to leave and the other one has issues and somebody's not talking. There's a whole bunch of variables that happen when you don't allow the women to build the bond first. And, you know, I, I just try to stress that to people because to, to me that that's the crux of a lot of the issues that come up when you deal with um, poly or plural uh, relationships. Outside of mentally being prepared, what should a what should a man have? Uh, what preparation does he need before he even starts entertaining having more than one wife? Because I know you see these conscious dudes running around talking about four or five wives, but they can't take care of the kids, they can't take care of the wives. Like, what should be the expectations of a man before he even considers having more than one wife? Well, I think first and foremost that whoever the brother is needs to be real with himself in his current situation. Um, because there, there may be situations um, outside of the emotional and mental aspect where even though he may desire to have another wife, he can't afford it. And, okay. you know, and, and there are situations where all the, all the spouses get together and they chip their money in equally. But there's also certain dynamics where women want to be housewives. And if you choose to enter into that relationship with her, then you're also accepting that this is what she wants. But these things have to be made clear from the job. So for, for, for men, I'm not a man, I can't really speak, but I, I think what he should look at is his current life and the reality of what it is that I can do what it is that I can't do, and how well am I able to provide for the women that I choose to have in my life? Let me let me read this uh, question by Chantal. Um, I understand even I possibly could have a hard time with polygamy, but with the lack of decent black men in the household, this may be necessary to save the black family in America. And we, we talked about this somewhat offline as far as uh, with women, especially here in America, becoming so more masculine and men become, becoming more feminine, that there's a lack of good black men, masculine black men. And of course, women already naturally outnumber us. Is, is that a good reason to justify polygamy? I don't think it is. Because... I mean, I can see if people opt into it because they think that that's a viable means of, uh, you know, helping a nation build. But at the end of the day, we enter into these relationships for ourselves mm -hmm. because we enjoy these people. We, we want to thrive and grow and progress in, in our personal lives and collectively with these people. So for me to... To, to tell somebody that you should be in a polygamous relationship because there's more women than, than men means that essentially, if I, if I was to say that to a woman, that I, I will also be by insinuation saying that it's quite possibly you may be settling for the wrong guy or you may be settling for a relationship that's not up to par to what you want in your life. So I, I wouldn't say that. Some people could, but for me, I, I just don't think, um, because I, I regard black men and women so highly that I don't feel like we should settle in our relationships. Like that's the one area that I think both sides, men and women, should have the utmost regards and have the utmost standards 
and requirements in their partners and in themselves as well. Um, so I, I would I wouldn't say that. I, I think that you know a lot of people use that as a cop out to do do a lot of crazy stuff. So um, it, it 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 is. As far as numbers, it's viable, but I think in practice, it, it it's something else. Okay. Now, your your ex husband, and what, okay, so your father, he was in the military, mm -hmm. correct? Your right. uh, your ex husband, when you guys attempted to go the polygamous route, was he in corporate America or what did we what did he do? Like, what kind of job? Like, I'm just a firm believer. Like, if you work in corporate America, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, recommend polygamy just in case something happened to your corporate job like what are your thoughts on that as far as if the man like what did he do as far as for a living well, to take care of you guys financially um at that time um we, we actually had a business together we hosted sex positive events at you know clubs and other venues like in tri-state area and the dmv area so we were doing very well um as a couple, you know, so our money was kind of determined by what it was that we did. Um, I know of a few couples where the husbands are in corporate America, but they're very discreet. And I think the, the one thing that even though my relationship didn't work, it, it, it lasted as long as it did because of the line of work that we did. Because we were able to say, hey, you know, we're doing this and, you know, that kind of gives us the liberty to have the sort of relationship that we want. Not to say that what you do determines your relationship, but it kind of, it gave us more of a luxury. It gave us more of a girth to do so. Now, your, uh, your book, Principles of Femininity, I think is, mm -hmm. I don't know the principles yet, we'll, we'll, we'll get into them, but just from the title alone, uh, I, I think it's important because, again, especially in Atlanta, you know, I, I, honestly, I believe that women are a reflection of men. So, right. you know, as here in Atlanta, as you know, you have the Dallow brothers, you have, you know, homosexuality, you have transsexual, that movement going on. Now you see the women becoming more masculine or coming out as being lesbian, lesbian or, or whatnot. Um, so what, what kind of principles do you think when, in your book, like can we go over some of the principles that women could implement where they won't lose their femininity and just remain just women? Well, in the book, um, what I basically try to do is illustrate that women have their own terms and value systems just simply on the sheer fact of their gender. And it's not, and, and I, uh, the way that I approach it is from a natural aspect. And it, and it also touches men and the value of men, but I tried to focus more on women because I think for us, we, we lack an identity, especially um, African-American women, we lack an identity. Like I couldn't put a group of 10 women from the same city together and say, describe, if I was to put them in a room one by one and say, describe to me the typical black woman. Every sister would, there may be some similarities, but most, most, most often, every sister would describe a different woman and that's based on how she sees herself mm -hmm. and then how she sees the world reflect, reflected back onto her. So for me, like one of the main principles was defining what consciousness is and you know to me and i always say this that a lot of people like to create these mental maps of consciousness as like a linear thing or, or almost like a number line like you know negative five being the worst and then positive five being the best and for me consciousness is sort of like an onion where you dive into opposed to um looking at a scale and we, we as black women, we first have to deal with the concept of consciousness in regards to us as women. Mm -hmm. And our self-identity 
is derived from our consciousness. Now, black women generally are very complex. There's no two black women that are alike. But at the same time, most of us, our differences are, our, our differences are similarities, the fact that we have differences. And, you know, I just tried to, to talk my way through arriving at consciousness and how consciousness helps cultivate self-identity and how self-identity cultivates self-value and self-devotion and then finally direction and end result. So Yanaverse itself was kind of like a catchy thing that everybody's using, but it really kind of, to me, encapsulates the idea of womanship and who women are and, and what we should aspire to be. And I'm trying to think. Um, the, the, pr the principles themselves, I kind of left up into the interpretation of the reader. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason that I did that was because, for one, I understood that black women are very complex. Right. And for two, I understand the, understand the fragility. Like, I don't want to list out, well, this is what you have to do, and this is what you have to do, and this is what you have to do. Only because every woman has a different desire for herself. So... The, the principles themselves are just these general layouts of women are valuable because they have the capacity to do X, Y, and Z within their certain skill sets. And also the fact that we have a strength in the fact that we are women, not necessarily that we have to be these independent, strong, men ain't shit, I don't, excuse me, you know, I don't need a man but the fact that we are women and our strength is in our fragility and the fact that we are frail and that we are emotional and we need to pride ourselves in these things. Um, so the princi principles themselves are, I don't wanna say ambiguous, but they're, they're, they're kind of very vague in the term that I didn't wanna steer a woman a certain way, but I just wanted to at least attempt help women come and form their own conclusions about womanship according to them. And I, I did give general guides like, um, you know, finding strength and, fr and fragility and owning your emotions. But I didn't want to say that you should be overly emotional or emotionless because that creates a, a, a conflict in consciousness or a conflict in the narrative of consciousness. So um, the, the, book, the, the book is a bit crazy it's, um, <laughs> because, it, you know, I don't want people to believe that, you know, I'm some well-versed sex therapist that, but the way that I present it is from me reflecting back on my journey from me believing that I was a woman to coming to understand and confirm to myself that I was really a black woman. And, and I think a lot of us, we kind of put this label, well, my skin is brown and I was brought up here and I have this lingo and this. And, and those things don't define black womanhood. And you know, I try to dispel the difference between stereotypes and one taking the time to figure out who she is, opposed to allowing the, the environment to dictate and shape who she ends up being. What um, so in, in my honest opinion, and you know I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or how do you feel about this? Give me your thoughts on this. I believe that Black American women are more complex and diverse than African women. Just in my experience, being so, do you think that? Black American women being so diverse and complex, how does that affect them in, I guess, fighting a mate or just living overall? Well, I, I think that complexity oftentimes creates a lot of conflicts in their personal narratives. Um, and from what, from what I've experienced with African women, they, they are very clear, direct, and, and you know, you can kind of see a, a certain set of patterns generally within most of them. 
Um, and I, I think because African American women have that complexity that that I, I can't see in any other woman, um, it, it does sometimes hinder a wo that woman's ability to be um, functional positively in a relationship. And again, it goes back to self-identity because like I said earlier, African American women don't have an identity. Mm -hmm. we, we claim that we have an identity, but you, I, I can't outside of myself. I can't even as celebrities. Like I can't look at one. I can't point out one black female celebrity and say, "Yep, she's a typical African American woman." Wow. I can see a lot of stereotypes, or I can see exceptions to the rules, but I can't say. That sister right there, that's a typical African American woman. And and this is what we have to deal with. And until we kind of have a consensus, and it, it doesn't have to be a consensus, but until we can kind of hone in on who we are, as for one, as the individual, and then two, after that, as a collective, you're gonna see a lot of this um, I guess hiccups in relationships, hiccups in parenting. And a lot of stuff that you know people like to um, make sure that they you know tell online. What do you? What's the root of? In, in your honest opinion, what's the root of African women? I mean, African American women, Black American women, being so complex and diverse. Like, what's the root of it? And then, like, answer that first, and then I'll ask. Uh, I guess part two of the question. What do you? What, what's the root of it? Do you think? To me, I think the root lies in the fact that we were removed from anything that resembled a true culture. It was stripped from us. We were, we were severed. It was like somebody cut the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. And then after that severing, there was approaching close to five, 400 plus years of active enslavement, which creates again, conflicts and narrative. And it's like, you already have a full person and then they're trying to understand who they are. And then you wipe the slate clean and then begin to build the things that you wanna build on it. And regardless of what we like to say and a lot of what Black Conscious YouTube likes to say, a lot of our behaviors are reflections and adaptions of light consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm not using that as a scapegoat for all of the behaviors that we do have and all of the issues that we, we present to other people and inflict on ourselves as well. But what I will say is that that does play a part in that. But at the same time, that being understood, I always say when you know better at that point, you have to do better. Like if I know that my behavior, who I am today, is a direct reflection of white dominance and white colonization and all the things that vary or, I guess, branch off from that concept, then I have to actively make the, the effort to fix myself and then ensure that I don't repeat, repeat the behavior. And a lot of times with women, we don't, I think with black people in general, we don't like to do that. Like to, to work on ourselves requires a lot of discomfort. And for us, what I've seen typically, or I'll just say generally, um, is that we like to hit easy buttons. We like to go for the status quo because there is no compromise in ourselves when we go for the status quo. There's no, um, unknown area there's no gray there's no being scared or 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 possibly even suffering or losing something if we go for the status quo and then to work on ourselves there's that unknown factor and then also the notion that there may be a lot that you have to sacrifice and i think with women and i said this earlier um we have this addiction to the sensation of emotions mm -hmm. and what what I mean by that is that because we're women and we're the nurturers and we're the creatives and 
we kind of thrive in that realm of feeling the emotion, being present in the moment, and going through all the processes of the, the, the beginning of the initial onset of the emotion, the climax, and then, you know, the ease on out of that thing. So with that being said, a lot of times we perpetuate traumas that have been put on us by other people just so we can relive that emotion, just so we can feel that moment again. And I'm not saying this is true for every woman. And I'm not saying that we purposely hurt ourselves just so we can feel the pain. But a lot of times when you hear women talk about any sort of trauma, they kind of make an emphasis on the hurt. Or if they were really glad, they make an emphasis on the joy that it brought them. And because we haven't done a course correction into putting, I guess, those mental stimuli into productive behaviors or creating things that, that, that create productive or positive outcomes, sometimes we have women that kind of live and revel in the trauma. Right, right. So I, I don't know if that makes any sense to the audience. I can't no, no, see it. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, I think it's going away now. Uh, so there's, I guess, a movement called feminism, who I guess would celebrate the complexity and diverseness, uh, diversity of women, I guess. Um, you know, so like everything you said, as far as you can't tell. I mean, there's nothing really, I guess, you can't really tell, how can I, what's the question I wanna ask? Um, if women were to be homogeneous, genius, I guess, as far as like African women, they all have a uh, code of conduct and they all mm -hmm. act similar versus black American women all, 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 all over the place. If I were to say that black American women should be more like, African women, I will be labeled missionistic and the feminists will say women have a right to do whatever they want. You know, you know, they could slut walk. Um, you know, they don't have to be this just straight and to the point or homogeneous woman like the African woman. What are, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> that makes sense. My yeah, point. yeah, I, I got you. Um, yeah, you know, like I, like I said earlier offline, like I'm not well versed in the whole thing because my, my mind just doesn't move in the in the in the realm of feminism because I, I believe that if women really desire to be feminist then they would adopt some sort of core principles of femininity and not um this brashness that american society has propelled as accepted behavior um I, I think that women, we, we outlash when we feel like we're not being heard, period. And I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you've experienced it. Like, you know, you may be having a conversation with your woman and you may have just for a moment darted off to a thought that was actually really important, but because she noticed it, she, she oh, what you're not listening to me. And so like, we have a, a serious problem with not being heard because we want, our, our desire to be heard equates that the person that's listening to us and responding to us perceives that whatever it is that we're saying and essentially us, we have value. And I, I think <laughs> femi feminism, like I said, it's not something that I, I think about because I just think it's absurd, okay. essentially. I, I think it's I think it's wrapped up in a really nice package and um, it, again, because it's that threat of feminism to me is like a hub of emotional buttons that what? women like to push, you know. Um, there was even, um, uh, there's another brother on YouTube named Angel and he has a channel. And there was a video that he did with two sisters and they were basically talking about um, there was this private all women Facebook group that they were a part of and the, you know when you get in there It's really nice and they, they help the women out if they need help with their light bill 
and they're sharing photos of their kids and they're having this real big emotional flowers and rainbow kumbaya in this group. But the second that you interject a man, or there was a sister that was married, I, I believe the story was, and she was talking about how she was in love with her husband and her relationship was awesome. These sisters, because this didn't fit in the core of the, the miserable, I need to push the hurt button. We need to talk about how he cheated on us. And we need to talk about all these things that push these emotional buttons that we're addicted to. They resulted in having CPS come to her home. Wow. And sometimes, again, emotions for women are an addiction like drugs it's like you know some of us are like when it comes to these emotions and feeling the sensation of these emotions it's like crack it's literally for some women i, I mean i don't know if anybody in the audience knows a sister that is always in love every time she meets a brother she's always in love and she goes through the emotions of oh he does this and oh he does that and those same behaviors, if you look at them from an objective point of view, are the same habitual behaviors of a drug abuser. And <laughs> what we don't realize is that there are people that are very good at giving environments that are full of emotional buttons for us to push at any given time. It's just like certain people know how to say one sentence and we just go ape over it. We just lose all control, all composure over it. So for me, feminism is a hub for women to be emotional and to, and, and to talk about all the things that they feel like takes away their value. And my, my problem with it is, is that if you figure out what your value is within yourself, then what is feminism? If there's no need, if you already have your core beliefs and you have your self value already established before any group tries to tell you what they are, then what is their purpose? How do they exist to you? And that's all I can say about feminism. You know, Nancy made a great point in the uh, chat room. Let me uh, read a comment and get your uh, input on this. Uh, Nancy, I think is from the Congo. Nancy, are you from the Congo or are you from Kenya? Uh, she, but she said, our wealth, wealthiness for African women is children and, and husband, family, you know. African Americans, women, for African Americans, African American women is job first and money and then children. That is a difference, Dinas. What, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. I, I definitely agree with the sister. And peace to the chat, even though I can't see you guys. Um, I, I think, and I, and I think that it's it's firstly and, and most importantly that way because of american society mm -hmm. and then secondly um again it's wrapped up in this beautiful package of you know if you dedicate your time to your career and having x y and z you know and then pushing the family aspect off because you know american society is is based on individualism like you know we now, people have these arguments that marriage is a business and it's not a, a union of two people who wish to you know, spend their lives together and create other lives based on their love for each other and their goals. And American society is built on, on, on a value system that has nothing to do with family. It has nothing to do with com having a community or the commune. So, you know, she's not reaching at all with that statement. So I agree with the sister. Yeah, she's from the uh, Congo. Let's see, we got some more questions in the chat room. Uh, I know I passed up a couple. Um, uh, I think they were all answered. Uh, yeah, but where, where can people uh, pick up your book at? Well, the universe right now, I'm still editing it for um, okay. print. Um, when I first wrote it, I made it for a uh, digital download until I got past 300 pages. And I'm like, I'm not just because all of my ebooks I give away for free. Mm -hmm. um, so Yaniverse itself is probably a couple months out. But I, I do have a website um, 
called she's healing.com. And I do have a couple of eBooks there. One title to think of dreaming big, which is just for women who just aren't really quite sure about value systems and their personal self-worth. And then I also have another book called universal lover that just kind of deals with the aspects of sexuality and, and finding, um, your, your niche inside of sexuality. Um, but yeah, Yanniverse is still a couple of months out. You say your site is called She's Healing. Yeah, yeah, She's Healing dot com. Okay. S-H-E-S. I want to make sure we get uh, all the information in the chat so they could check it out. And then you also you're a uh, you're a content writer. Yeah. Uh, like what what kind of content? Just I do know. a lot of content for like online brands and businesses and people of whatever digital citizen notoriety. Um, I do some graphics too and I do do website design, but basically I kind of focus on writing, like filling in the blanks for people who are basically too lazy to do it, you know? Um, so I help people there. I have written or ghost written chapters and books for other authors, but, um, you know, my main staple, my main main bread and butter is content writing. Okay. And then also your, uh, you, you put, I, I'm reading your, uh, I guess your signature page, you put uh, exercise your selectivity. What, uh, what do you, can we expand on that? Um, exercise your like, selectivity was basically something that kind of, that kind of popped up for me because going through my own personal relationships, what I realized is that freedom of choice is really a real thing. And I, I personally believe that both men and women should be absolutely exclusive in who they choose to have in their lives. Not to say that your partner has to dot every I and cross every T in your list of things that you desire. However, I do think there's absolutely nothing wrong with being selective in your needs. Um, you know, we have to really do a serious vetting of the people that we have in our lives because our bodies are our sacred spaces, men and women. And, you know, exercise your selectivity was just my way of, of saying that in short. Now, do you feel, uh, Chantal, she, she, asked, she asked this question, uh, do you feel there are a shortage uh, or imbalance, well, a shortage of successful black men in, in, in America? Uh, and we're not just talking about just financially um, as far as measuring success by uh, the amount of money you make, but just overall, um, everything. Do you think there's a shortage of black successful black men in America? Well, okay, first off, uh, to answer that question, I, I have to go into the word success itself because success for every person is different on an individual basis. Um, you know, so success for one man may be making a lot of money and success for another man may be having a wife that loves him and a, and a loving family. So for me, we have to look at that first. And then for two, because of those things, I, I do think that women pass up on a lot of quality men, if you look at success in those terms. Um, I know plenty of women that make more money than their partners, um, as well as the opposite. But I think the real core of it is, is the quality. What is success to him? And does that success align with what you want in your life? You know, he may be a brother that his, his end goal is just to own a business where he doesn't have to worry about his bills. And it may not even be $100,000 a year, but as long as he can pay his bills and not worry about it. And if you're a woman that you're not, your endeavor is not luxury in excess, that may work for you. So <laughs> I, um, I, I think we have to look, because there's a, there's a really interesting thing. A lot of times when we use words, we have these 
definitions that were given to us. But I think the, the awesome thing about life and, and about people is that our, we have this creative side and our ability to think critically. And even though we have these preconceived notions about the word success and how it's defined, that doesn't mean that it's limited to just that. We can reinterpret and redefine those things however we wish. So I think first we have to look at what success is for that man and that woman and then see if that version of success in his reality aligns with that woman's you know, end result and how she sees herself as being successful in her life. Okay, and then um, what, what, what kind of principles or what should a woman look for when trying to find, uh, I know there's not the perfect mate or finding the ideal mate. Like what, what should she, because a lot of women don't know, what should she look for? In a um, see, I, I, I really try not to answer that question, <laughs> but I'll, I'll say this, I've, and it kind of goes back to what we just talked about. You know, for one, she has to figure out who she is. She has to figure out her value system. She has to figure out what her end result is and where she wants to go. And once she figures out those things, the man that fits in all of that, the list of things for him kind of reveal themselves without her having to think too hard about it. Um, so what I would always say is that a woman has to establish herself first. And then if she is actively looking for a partner, that for one, she should exercise her selectivity. Two, she should be able to match what it is that she, he has to offer. And then three, does the notion of him the notion of being without him reasonably make you feel uneasy. If he fits your life, if you guys work together, if whatever quirks or dislikes or pet peeves, whatever you want to call it, you can compromise with because all the glorious things about him outweigh those. Does the notion of him not being with you make you feel uneasy? And I think once you have those things, then you kind of get further to finding a guy. But I don't really have like, you know, he should be this way or he should be that way. Like, you know, my personal preference is I like a man that wears watches um, and has change in his pocket. That's just my thing. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to tell a woman that you have to have a man that wears a watch and has change jingling in his pocket. Like that means nothing to her or doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, symbolize anything to her, but it does to me. So, I, I mean, I think we generally know as women what we're looking for. We want a guy that's funny and, and all that. But, okay, well, here goes one. Go ahead. Like, I had wrote in one of my older blogs about, you know, if you want to see, like, because a lot of us women, we kind of fall in love with the potential of a man. And I want to bypass all that. Okay. So, a lot of us ask the question, where do you see yourself? in five to 10 years. You have to fill that question out the window because when you ask that question, what you're basically asking is what does he fantasize him being so far out? Like, okay, say, even for you, like say you 10 years from now, you want to be this super huge pop star, right? Mm -hmm. But what are you doing today to accomplish that? What is your system? Where is your method? What are you practicing? What is your demonstration of you getting to that? So for me, I tell women, don't ask the five to 10 years, but ask him, where does he see himself in one to two? Because when you ask that question, you're basically forcing him to list out to you what he's doing today and what those things are going to result in. And then once you get that result and you actually see him demonstrate the things that he's working on, at that point, you can make a choice. Well, yeah, he's a man of his word. He, he, his ambitions or his walk matches his talk. So that, that would be the only thing that I would say. Okay. And, and the last question, and I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to, to close it out. Anything you, you want to touch on. Uh, Prince Jalabar wants to know, do you think that dysfunctional single mothers in black American community can be defeated by cutting welfare, teaching young women to be more responsible? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Or is that like a loaded question? Or 
I mean, it, it sort of is, but I'll try to answer it. Um, my first, my first response to that would be: ha, ha, How often are men on welfare, and how often do they understand the hoops and hurdles that most people that are on it, or even Section Eight, have to go through to even, for one, obtain it and then maintain it? Two, just for argument's sake, today Trump decided today. No more Section 8, no more food stamps, no more, no more welfare. As black women, how do, how do you answer what to do with those women? Are we just letting them die off and starve? Is, or is that what we're saying? Because if that was what we're saying, then we're saying that black men or this, this fred, fragment of black men endorse the deaths of women and children. I don't... I don't think entitlements are, are they're set up to help, but they are also enablers. That is true. That is very true, and I won't deny that. But I also think that if there aren't other people and other organizations out here that are creating some sort of system or organization to bring these women from this point to a better point in their lives and to give them the course correction to say, because there, there are a lot of mothers that do do damage to their children, but the same can be said that there are a lot of mothers that work really hard at being good parents as single mothers. So we can't, we can't say that only one exists without the other. We can't say that. So what we should be saying is that if there's such a problem, if, if, if black men and black women or just black people in general truly believe but there's a problem with single mothers, social entitlements, then what can we do to make the course correction in these people's lives, in these children's lives, in these women's lives? Because I don't see any rational answer for it. What I will say is that there is a problem. There is a problem. But there's always a story behind it as well. And I don't want people to think that I'm solely 100% in defense of women because we have a lot of problems. And I've seen a lot of women make some very bad mistakes with their children. Very, very bad mistakes. But when, when you look closer at it, what you see is, is that some of these women genuinely don't know any better. And some of these women genuinely do know better, but there is not, there's no other option for them. Just imagine if you yourself were a person that the only hours you could work were Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made mistakes. You know, you graduated high school, but you didn't go to college. So your, your opportunity for jobs is limited. So that means that you're only making a living at about a money. You make further mistakes by choosing the wrong partners. You're not being selective. But we all make mistakes, and we should be able to make a concession for people who do make mistakes. And then these same people, because they're limited in their resources, they're limited in their, their, their support system, they're kind of stuck in this rut where they want more for themselves, and they want more for their children but there's nothing out there. And instead of us helping out these women, we criticize them brutally, savagely in some cases. And I just think that if we ever, because I know a lot of men will say, you know, the reason why we're so hard on these women is because, you know, we hold them to a higher standard and we want them to do better, and this is just tough love and criticism. And, and that, you know, in certain regards, that's fair. I'm not going to knock brothers for that. But at the same time, if you're the one criticizing, but you're not actively doing anything to help, then you're just as complicit as these women. If we can say the same thing about white people, if white people not speaking up about the savagery of some white people and them being passively complicit, than to criticize the same women, yet not to offer any, even if it's just a word of kindness or just to grab her groceries, then you are just as complicit as she. 
and that's that's really all I can say about it. Like, I, I, you know, I don't know. Like, the whole gender war thing is very, it's very shaky and it's very volatile. So I try to stay out of it. But you know, there's a lot of gray area in that that we don't address. Again. I, I do not endorse women who do bad things on purpose. Mm, okay. I don't endorse it. I do not. You know, I can give you, I, I'll give you a story. Go ahead. There's, um, there's a sister that's on YouTube, and she talks about black consciousness, and I was on her panel a few times. I really enjoy this sister, right? And, you know, after some time, she made me aware of the fact that there were some people posting her personal information online. Mugshots, you know, when she was young, and I think, you know, she, you know, had a, I don't know, a DUI or something like that. Um, and then went as, as far as to post fake pages with her children's names on it. And then as time went on, the powder keg blew. And then I found out that one of the sisters that's on her panel was complicit in the whole scheme to try to digitally defame, defame this girl. And it hurt me so bad because I'm like, you know, if we're, if we're talking consciousness, right, quote unquote, and if we're talking unity, quote unquote, and if we're talking about loving our brothers and sisters and, and coming together as a unit, a unit and a commune, and we have these people doing these awful things to our own, to a sister that, was never trying to hurt anybody. I myself can't endorse that sister. I can't endorse nothing that she did. Nothing. And it was so bad that I had to make a pot. Like, if you go to my Google Plus page right now, a week ago, I made a comment about how awful I felt. And I understood why brothers sometimes come down so critically when they see things like this. And, you know, as women, and I say it quite frankly, we have to tighten ranks because if we, if, if we're the ones saying, oh, well, you're only speaking for a certain few and you can't, you know, I don't fall in line with what those sisters are doing, then you need to socially set yourself in this area here and at the same time try to do something to help these sisters, even though not all of them are savable. But you have to start closing ranks, you know? and. Right. You know, black women do have to take responsibility for other black women. We do. And I think we failed at that. We, we have failed at that because we're so, the way society is set up, you know, there's no incentive in being kind or being compassionate to another sister. There's no, there's no, there's no perks in that outside of emotional attachment or, you know, having a, a, a sisterhood, but that's on an individual basis. But there's no... Like if you're talking consciousness and black unity, there's no incentive in trying to help a sister that's hurting other women and hurting children. So, you know, in essence, there's a lot of variables when we talk about women that are single mothers and they're on social entitlements. Um, there, I mean, in some of the fields that I work, I can tell you that there's a, for every one black woman that's on welfare, there's like 20 more white women. Right. You know, but we don't talk about that. Like, we don't want to make that comparison because some of us don't want to qualify that in, in, in the equation, I guess. But, you know, if we're going to criticize these women, then for one, we have to have women that are attempting to set, set a standard. But at the same time, men and women have to come together to try to at least help the ones that are willing to accept help. Well, Ms. Diallo, thank you for coming on this early this morning. I really appreciate it. I know we've been trying to look up, link up for like the last couple of, you know, you hit me up like two years ago. Yeah, it's been that long. Uh -huh. But it's yeah. not good. <laughs> it's not so good. I'm, glad, I'm glad you uh, you came on. Do you, do, you have a, do you have a YouTube page? You have a YouTube page, don't you? Yeah, you can look me up under Angelica Diallo. People can probably, I mean, you know, I'm not in the chat, but I'll I'll jump in the chat before I go. And people can click my image and if they want to subscribe, they can. I don't my YouTube channel is crazy. It may not be for everybody, but yeah, I do no, have no, I mean, please, I mean, shoot, that hop in the chat, shout it out, 
put all your contact information in there. And then also to do me a favor, email me like all your links and sites that you want me to put under the uh, the uh, description box too. So I can go ahead and put it there too. Email all that to me. So, but uh, again, thank you for coming on. People in the chat, thank you for uh, uh, participating as well. Um, search for who? Make sure you guys uh, subscribe or follow my Instagram page because I'm doing the uh, Africa Personified series. Uh, so please, uh, like I said, I have thousands of photos from when I've been just from my travels in Africa that you know just been sitting on a, my disk drive. That I'm still going to do a book, like a coffee table book, but I was like, let me go ahead and put the photos out now. So go on Instagram, search for who, follow me, like the photos, Facebook, Twitter. Snapchat, follow me on there too. Make sure you go to dinosamir.com, search for huru.com, and then go to amazon.com and search your name Dinosamir, and all my books will come up that I've uh, written. So, again, people, I appreciate it. Ms. Diallo, thank you for coming on. Thank uh, you for having me. No, no problem. And thank uh, you, Chad. I don't, you know, I don't know what people think of me, um, but I appreciate them being so patient with my, my craziness. No, no, no. They, they love you, the chat. They, they, oh, they, they, oh, y'all are so nice. Thank you. Oh, by the way, this is my first online interview. Really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck? Oh. Well, at least on YouTube. This is my first YouTube interview. So, I, you know, th this is a cherry popper for me. I, I appreciate you, and I appreciate the chat for being so welcoming and warming. And, and hopefully, maybe again, we can do some more videos. Yeah, so, and then, and then you know, you're more than welcome to come back. Don't be a stranger. I don't, I don't want you to disappear for two years. You know, make sure you well, I mean, I, I, I want I want to go to Africa. That's what I want to do. I think one of the first things I said to you is, when are you going again? Because I want to go. All right, so here we go. Senegal, first week of November. I think the dates are like November, I leave November 3rd, come back like maybe on the 12th, maybe. Uh, Ghana, I leave Thanksgiving Day, and I come back, I think, December 4th. And mm -hmm. then I'll be in Benin and Togo. From like uh, I think it's like January third to the twelfth, something like that. You know, you know, have to send that to me in an email because I I want to go and I want to take the kids. I want them to to see all of that. You know, they haven't been so. Okay. All right, cool. So I'll send you the dates and then I'm gonna let you know. Like when I do Africa, I do like the parts unknown and parts unseen, and you know, I be I be rough out there. I'm in the villages. You know, sleeping on the floor sometime. Like I just, you know, I do like, yeah. Well, maybe oh, when yeah. I go with you, I'll go by myself. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It would be. I mean, the kids should be fine, but I just, you know, I, I don't know what to expect. So I think, yeah. The, yeah, that, that sounds safer. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, usually I'm, you know, like on just like a little cot or a little, uh, not, not an air mattress, but just a makeshift bed. You know, and I. I I just, I, I rough it when I go sometimes, depending on where I'm at. So, you know, uh, definitely not the uh, Hilton Hotel. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, more than welcome to join me. You guys, thank you for uh, coming and peace. Peace.